We're for sharing innovative treatments and preventing disease before it ever develops. Learn how our team is working to better care for you on this edition of UVA Health System Radio. Here's Melanie Cole. A rare but serious form of cancer, sarcomas often have no symptoms or nonspecific symptoms and can affect almost any part of the body. My guest is Dr. Michael Duvas. He's a board-certified pediatric hematologist, oncologist, and adult hematologist who specializes in caring for patients with leukemia, lymphoma, and sarcoma. Welcome to the show, Dr. Duvas. So tell us, what is a sarcoma? Well, in short, uh, sarcoma is a cancer of connective tissue. Um, so we're all used to thinking of cancers of organs like breast, liver, lung, and sarcomas are um, cancers of the material that keeps us together, muscles, bone, cartilage, fat. Okay, so people don't tend to think of those as you say. Are there any risk factors? Because we hear about risk factors for breast cancer or colon cancer, but what about for sarcoma? Are there certain risk factors that we can control and some that we maybe can't? Um, so sarcomas affect roughly 12 to 13,000 people in the United States annually. Uh, that's the number that's diagnosed. And the vast majority of those patients do not have any identifiable risk factors for the development of sarcomas. The known ones are radiation, which can be either radiation that's used as a therapy, so patients who have had prior radiation for breast cancer are at a very small risk for developing radiation in the radiation field. And similarly, patients who are treated uh, with radiation for other cancers have small defined risks for the development of sarcoma. Um, Otherwise, there are a group of rare genetic disorders, um, such as neurofibromatosis, Gardner syndrome, leaf romani syndrome, tuberous sclerosis, where there's a risk for sarcoma. These are all pretty rare syndromes, um, and not everybody who has them develops a sarcoma, but they are associated. So you mentioned some hereditary, some rare ones, and you mentioned radiation. It, it, you know, I've heard that maybe chemicals, exposure, and also people have heard about Kaposi sarcoma that's, you know, immune sure. deficient and such. So how rare are these? So um, chemical exposure is, is one that's uh, pretty rare um, in terms of its association with sarcoma. Um, it's uh, often difficult to establish associations between chemical exposures and cancers. Um, Kaposi's sarcoma is, uh, again, a uh, sort of rare sarcoma within a, uh, and sarcomas are a relatively rare cancer. They are um, most often seen um, within patients with immunodeficiency, most often acquired um, through HIV infection. Um, Kaposi's sarcoma was much more common in the 1980s and 1990s before the advent of highly effective therapies for um, HIV. And so, fortunately, its incidence has uh, decreased significantly in the last 20 years um, with uh, better treatments for HIV and AIDS. Dr. Duvas, are there any symptoms that people might come across that would send them to see you in the first place? So the the hard thing, as you mentioned in the introduction, is that um, sarcomas uh, can occur um, really anywhere in the body, on the limbs, on the torso, in the head and neck, um, and because they're cancers of the things that put us together, um, they can occur anywhere. And as a consequence, they can cause um, uh, different symptoms. Um, the most common, however, are the development of a lump of some type um, and or um, unusual pain that doesn't go away in a particular area of the body. So what what would someone do when they found a lump or they found particular pain? They come to see you, you do some tests. What do you do? So um, most often uh, people will have been diagnosed before they see me. Um, They'll often go um, to a primary care physician um, or um, in the emergency room and in the workup of a lump or a pain, um, uh, most often a scan of some type discovers uh, a tumor. 
um, and then they are often referred to a general surgeon or an orthopedist or a neurosurgeon for a biopsy. And then it's after that point when a diagnosis is made that they often uh, end up seeing me. Um, it, it sometimes occurs that I, I'm involved um, in the evaluation of, uh, of a tumor that's suspected to be a sarcoma, but I'd say it's more often that the diagnosis is established before um, people get to see me. And Dr. Uh, Juvas, what treatment options are available once it is diagnosed as a sarcoma? So, um, in general, for cancer, there are three groups of treatment options. Um, the first being surgical resection, um, the second being radiation, and the third uh, being chemotherapy, which is just a uh, large word that means medicine to treat cancer. Um, sometimes the chemotherapies fall within the bounds of uh, things that people traditionally uh, associate with chemotherapy. That is medicines that go in through an IV and sometimes cause uh, issues with nausea, vomiting, hair loss, the, the traditional uh, chemotherapy that people think about, but um, m more often recently there are um, pills that are being used for cancer in general and sometimes for sarcomas that we call uh, targeted therapy where um, an individual cancer um, uh, has an identified genetic problem and a drug has been designed to specifically address that. Um, a good example is uh, there's a tumor called a gastrointestinal stromal tumor, or a GIST, which is a sarcoma that most often arises in the stomach. Um, it is a distinct entity from stomach cancer, and it very often has a particular um, molecular abnormality that um, a medicine called imatinib or Gleevec that was initially developed to treat a, a chronic leukemia um, specifically addresses. Um, just tumors uh, used to be treated with traditional chemotherapy, and um, the effects were, I would say, less than optimal in terms of their, you know, their ability to, sh to shrink tumors and control their growth. Um, imatinib, um, in a, uh, a targeted way, uh, attacks the tumor in a very different way by uh, playing into um, its specific um, genetic abnormality and can be an extremely effective treatment for patients with tumors that are uh, unresectable um, or um, after their resection in order to prevent their recurrence. Um, so, again, in general, all of these modalities, surgery, radiation, traditional chemotherapy, and targeted therapies are used to treat sarcomas. And, Dr. Duvas, what advice do you have for listeners about coping, support, things that they should do while they're going through any one of these treatments, whether they've had surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, as you've discussed, when they're going through all of these things, what do you tell them to help them? Well, um, that's, a, that's a difficult question. Um, there are a variety of um, support um, services that um, are available, usually through the local uh, treatment center. Um, there are a lot of uh, great support services that are through national foundations um, that are often specific to the type of uh, disease that a patient has. Um, and then there are often um, a lot of uh, services that can be found, uh, you know, um, on the internet, on the web. I have a lot of patients who have found great support groups um, where they um, uh, link up with other patients who have uh, similar types of cancers and are going through similar types of treatments and have found um, these support groups extremely helpful in terms of um, sort of understanding uh, what, what others are experiencing uh, and uh, helping them to cope uh, with their situation. And why should patients come to UVA Cancer Center for their sarcoma care? Um, it's a good, good question. Uh, I would say um, there are several reasons. Sarcoma is a pretty uncommon disease. Uh, I mentioned before that about 12 to 13,000 people will be diagnosed with sarcoma in the United States uh, in, in a year. To compare that, there are about you know, 200 to 250,000 cases of breast and lung cancer diagnosed annually in the United States. And what this means is that... Um, uh, hematologists, oncologists, blood and cancer doctors are significant.
significantly less familiar with the treatment of sarcomas than they are with more common cancers. Uh, in addition, there are between 50 and 100 different types of sarcomas. So they're a rare disease, but they're also a very, very heterogeneous group. So it, it's difficult even um, for uh, people at major cancer centers uh, to develop a lot of familiarity with all the individual types because there just fortunately aren't that many of them out there. Um, but uh, the benefit of coming to a place like UVA is that um, although it's a rare disease, we still see a significant uh, proportion of patients diagnosed within the state and therefore are familiar with the treatments that are given, um, whether they're specialized surgical techniques for, um, for resection um, and potentially reconstruction of, of limbs. We have um, dedicated orthopedic oncologists um, for patients who have um, bone-based tumors or bone-based sarcomas. Um, we have radiation oncologists who um, specialize in the latest techniques of really targeting radiation to specific areas. Um, and, uh, you know, as uh, medical oncologists, um, we have more familiarity with the, the regimens that are given for these rare tumors and, um, you know, how, how, they, how they work, um, what side effects to expect, how to prepare patients to, to go through it and uh, to, to know um, what is out there as far as uh, new developments, such as new targeted therapies for relatively rare tumors. Thank you so much, Dr. Michael Duvas. You're listening to UVA Health Systems Radio. For more information, you can go to uvahealth.com. That's uvahealth.com. This is Melanie Cole. Thanks so much for listening, and have a great day.